Well, good morning or good afternoon and welcome and thank you for uh, attending Valve Medics a webinar on the CAM centric uh, plug valve and swing flex and surge buster check valves for industrial applications. So I hope everybody can hear me okay. If not, give me a shout out on the uh, question section there so I can uh, um, see. But anyway, uh, I think we're going strong and let's uh, let's continue on here. So the presenter today is Larry Woodworth. He is the business development manager for industrial products at Valmatic. And that's yours truly. So you're going to be listening to me for the next 45 minutes or so. So let's do a little housekeeping before we get on to the agenda. Um, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please type them in the questions box and I will answer them as we go. Um, if for some reason we are not able to get them as we're going along, we have a Q&A section at the end. And if for sometimes we have, for some reason we don't have any extra time, well then I will answer all the questions and I will send them to you uh, tomorrow or the day after. So you'll, we'll get all your questions answered. Uh, the other thing I want to do is um, we have a handout uh, in the handout section. Please download it. It's concerning check valves and what to look for and how to uh, uh, determine whether or not you're going to have slamming or not. So it's a, it's a document that we've uh, had uh, going out there for a long time. So it's very uh, valuable. So please uh, download that for your own uh, information in that. Uh, I do want to apologize because um, during the presentation, you're going to see my cursor as it just moved um, off to the side. Um, I'm on a single screen, so I have to do um, stuff in the background to run the webinar. Uh, but also, I'm going to use it from time to time to help spell out and show you what I'm talking about as we go along on the various slides. So I just want to say forgive me, but um, I think overall it's going to be a useful for everybody. So the introduction, we were just doing that. Um, that I'm going to give a short history on Valmatic. The, then we'll go over the cam centric plug valve, the swing flex check valve, surge buster check valve. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we'll go over all other uh, of the Valmatic products that we have to offer, just so you got an idea of all the different uh, product lines we have. <clears throat> And then we'll have questions and answers. So, like I said, if you have anything that uh, any questions you have, put them in as we go along here. So, Valmatic. Valmatic was started in 1966. It was founded by Andrew Nutter and Ted McGowan. They started with a single valve, the silent check valve, and then it went on to air valves fairly quickly after that. And then the company just grew and grew and grew. So you could see from some of the dates as we're going through there, um, you know, dual desk checks, tilted desks. We uh, built a new facility in Elmhurst in 1985. Um, the next year we introduced the swing, swing flex check valve. Uh, so it's been around in the market for a long time. And we'll be talking about this product line today. Uh, the cam-centric plug valve was introduced in 1987. So here again, it's been in the industry for a long period of time, and it's uh, it's been doing very well this uh, all these years. Uh, we expanded the facility in Elmhurst in uh, 94, and then also in 94, we came out with a new rectangular uh, cam-centric plug valve was introduced. So the surge buster that we're going to be talking about in a, in a little bit here uh, was introduced in 2003. And that's basically the swing flex with a spring in it. God. Um, then we acquired our facility in Addison, Illinois, uh, back in 2013. And now we have a total of 178,000 square feet of manufacturing and office floor space. So we've grown from basically the, the garage that uh, Andy and Ted started in until, uh, until now. So let's do a quick poll question here uh, to get things going. So let me get this launched up here for you. And it is going to be, 
do you specify valves? So if you would, you know, put in your answers and then submit it to me and then we'll kind of go over it when, uh, when everybody's done. So I'll give you a few seconds to go over that. Yeah, it kind of looks like we got just about uh, a full house here. So I'm going to close this out and then I'm going to share it with everybody. So here's the results. 50% said yes, uh, you do specify valves, 9% no, and uh, sometimes it's 41%. Now, if you think about it, if you're in sales, inside sales, outside sales or whatever, and you're talking to somebody that calls up wanting to talk about a valve or whatever, you're actually specifying a valve. So, you know, if you're in sales, your whole day is specifying valves or other products that you uh, might uh, uh, get into. So um, let's uh, hide this and then we're going to uh, go on now. Okay. So we'll get into the cam centric plug valve. Now, the scope of the valve for this is a half inch to 72 inch. We can do 150, 175 PSI, 250 PSI. So we can go fairly high in the pressure uh, range for this. <clears throat> Excuse me. The uh, end connections are generally flanged or threaded. But occasionally, even on the industrial side, you might come across a mechanical joint. So that's also available. The port in the valve is either rectangular, which is 75% flow, or full port, which is 100% flow. So you can buy either one of them. Now the standard for this particular valve that we make is AWWA C517, okay? Yes, that is a water valve, but you can use this valve into the same type of applications on the industrial side. So if you're looking at a water treatment plant or a wastewater treatment plant or whatever on an industrial site, it meets these valves. So we, we have them to offer. So that's what we're gonna talk about. So here's the operation of the, uh, the plug valve. So the plug, of course, is uh, there moving and it's off center because it's a camming action, which means that as the valve goes from close to open, it cams away from the seat at about three degrees or something like that. So it's not touching the seat anymore to cause any kind of damage to it or whatever. So it's a very nice touch uh, shut off. We, we also recommend that the pressure come from the direct side or to the back side of the uh, plug. So that'll do the sealing by pushing the plug up against the seat and uh, sealing it off. Now, with the body, of course, is a one piece. Now, since we have one seat, okay, we mark on the outside of the valve seat end. So that way you can tell if the valve is in service, which way the seat is. So if you can't see the directional arrow on there, well, then you're gonna see that this is the seat end because it's stamped on there. Okay. Now we do have a reverse pressure. It's a little lower than the direct pressure, but not by much. And it's, of course, we've already gone over the offset in that. Now, the one thing I do wanna point out while I'm thinking about it is, we do recommend that the valve shaft be placed in the horizontal position. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more here coming up. So let's talk about horizontal installation of the plug. Now you notice that both of the uh, animations, the plug is going upwards. So that means it's going away from this bottom area right here. So if there's no solids in the line, we suggest that you do the direct pressure, which is behind the plug, pushing it into the seat, do the ceiling. If it's got solids, we recommend the pressure on the seat side. Now what happens then, as you could see, the plug going in the upward direction, the flow is then going to take all this solids in the bottom of this valve and flush it down the pipe. Also, too, being on the seat side, if it's flushing all this debris this way, it's not going to be hitting a seat to damage it. So it's going to last a lot longer and do its job better. So uh, just remember that uh, the plug always opens up to the top 
And if you have solids, it comes in from the seat side, so it flushes that cavity out. So let's do the uh, vertical in the vertical uh, direction here. Um, so here again, if it's in a vertical direction, there's no solids or anything. The pressure needs to be coming up on the direct side or on the back side of that uh, plug to do the seal. But if there is solids, we would prefer that this, you put it in the line so that the solids actually are coming from the top. So that way they collect when the valve then goes open, all these solids fall down and get flushed out of the cavity. Here again, not hitting the seat and damaging it or anything, but being able to get flushed out of that valve to cause any damage. Okay. So features. Now, it, you know, it, you got the shaft seal system. Now that's a V um, packing uh, that's in there. And uh, permanently lubricated bearings, uh, the thrust bearings, the nickel weld, and the grit guard. Uh, so let's just kind of go over it a little bit more detail here with the bearing journals. The upper journal, you have your V-type packing, you have your gland follower, you have your shims and your pulls to be able to adjust that packing, you know, make it a little tighter if need be. You have your bearing, and then you have your grit guard, and then your thrust bearing. And that grit guard helps keep all the junk and debris and everything from getting up into the bearing and the packing area, which is very important. And then on the lower one, you have the same thing. You have the, uh, you know, here's your bearing, you have your grit guard and your thrust washer, and that grit guard keeps that stuff out of this area where the bearing and stuff is. Now remember, if it's a horizontal, if the stem is horizontal, it's less likely you're gonna get any debris in this area anyway, because it's gonna be down or falling into the bottom of the valve. If, you know, if it is in the, the vertical position, this keeps it from getting damaged. Now, materials of construction, okay? Um, standard body materials, cast iron, but we can do ductile iron as an option. The plug is gonna be Buna N or it can be EPDM, Viton, Neoprene. Um, it depends on what the application is. And if for some reason these materials do not suit the particular application you're wanting to put this in, let us know and we have other things that could possibly be available for you, okay? Now, bearings are gonna be permanently lubricated stainless steel. The rest of the construction, the shaft seals are normally Buna N V-type. However, as I just mentioned, if you're in an application where you can't have Buna N and you need some other material for the packing or the seals, let us know, we can change those out to whatever's necessary to meet your particular application. Thrust bearings are either going to be Teflon or stainless steel. Uh, the grid guard is Buna in a standard, but here again, if the application warrants a different material, we will put different materials in there to take care of that. The seat's always gonna be a nickel welded, okay? Always. The coatings. The exterior of the coating is gonna be a universal primer. So you can paint, the, paint it whatever you want or the customer can paint it for whatever he wants. But we can also put on the inside of the valve, fusion bonded epoxy, rubber lining or glass lining. So the rubber lining is great for solids and debris and stuff in the wastewaters and the sludge lines and so on. It, takes a, it can take a lot of abuse and as it used to, uh, used to be, it takes a leak and then keeps on ticking. The old Timex commercial. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just showed my age. Um, anyway, the uh, glass lining then would be good for chemicals, all different kind of chemicals and stuff that you can get into. So we, we have those available uh, to get into different applications for you. Now, I just wanted to kind of go over what uh, the rubber lining, I'm sure all of you know what a rubber lining looks like and that. But what happens is, okay, the rubber is always going to be a black color, but the rubber also extends out on the edge of the flange. So it, sometimes people use it as a gasket, sometimes they put a gasket in there doing whatever. Now, if it's glass lining, and the glass line is usually a green color, so you can kind of tell, right? 
And so the glass lining ends right here at the beginning of the throat going into the valve. The reason for that is, is if you bolt down the flanges together too hard, you'll crack the glass and then it's not gonna do you any good. So you have to use then a gasket in this area if you're using the glass lining, okay? Now you can kind of see it, but this is what's marked on seat end is what it is. That's where the, the marking would be on both sides. Just so uh, you know that uh, when you look at it, you could tell if you're not looking at the arrow or if for some reason only that part of the flange is showing and the rest of it's covered up with insulation or whatever, then you can see what's going on. Actuation, worm gears, pneumatics, double actings or spring returns or any kind of an electric actuator. Now, what's, what's nice about Valmatic is we don't have our own actuator, okay? Or we don't specify one particular brand. Whatever the customer wants, we will purchase it and put it on the valve if that's what they want. If not, uh, the rep uh, can do it in the field, put on whatever uh, actuator that they're, uh, they're losing, but it just gives us more versatility. So we're not tied down to one actuation company. So uh, we know a lot of company, our customers out there have their own specified, they want Limitorx, Allmarks, EIMs, Rotorx, Betises, whatever. Um, so we don't have to worry about that. So we can put anybody's actuator on there. Let's do another quick poll question here. So let me get this. So here's the uh, here's the next poll question. Are plug valves suitable for pigging or cleaning the pipeline? Yes, no, or it depends on the valve and the application. So please um, submit your uh, your answers on this. I'm uh, curious to see what everybody's going to come up with here. All right, let me give you a couple more seconds here. All right, I'm gonna close this out. Now I'm gonna share it with everybody. What do we got here? So we got yes, 23%, no, 35, and depends on the valve and application. That is correct. It really depends on the application and the valve, whether or not you can pig it. Um, I'm gonna go over this uh, real quick in the next slide, which which be, but uh, hold on to that thought for just one second here. We're gonna hide this and we're gonna go on to the next slide. Now here's the opening of a plug valve when the plug is full open. So on the left-hand side, it's 100% port and on the right-hand side, it's regular or 75%. So you can see that it's still a little oblong even at 100%. But, okay, what, what makes it a little bit better is you have all sorts of different pigs, okay? And it's kind of, um, I don't know, it, it's a term being been used for hundreds of years. But anyway, if the pig is flexible, it can go through a plug valve because you don't have to worry about it. So it'll squeeze through that area and then back out again and still be able to clean out the pipe. Here again, depending on the application and so on of what's going through. If it's not a flexible pick and it's designed to do more scraping of the inside of the, uh, the pipe, well, then you're going to have to possibly go to another valve that actually has a full round port uh, in it. But for the most part, a lot of the applications, you know, in sludge lines and stuff like that, a flexible pig goes through these valves very nicely. Okay, so we're all we're all good on that one. So some of the applications for the plug valves, wastewater, sludge lines, uh, chemicals, process waste, slurries, cooling towers, process lines. I mean, there's all sorts of different applications that this plug, go, plug valve goes into. So don't be shy. Let us know what, uh, what you're looking at so we can help you out. So I thought this was kind of a neat little picture. Um, I have a weird sense of humor, but anyway, um, this was sent to us and this is our plug valve. It's 100% port. It's a 42 inch size. Now, 
that truck happens to be an, a Ford Ranger, which was the earlier model. Um, but that trunk is about six and a half feet wide. All right. The valve itself from face to face is almost five and a half feet. From widthwise, it's about five and a half feet. Okay. Now here's here's what chuckles you you think you know uh, it's not going to be uh, very much, but the truck itself weighs 4,000 pounds, approximately. This plug valve weighs approximately 14,000 pounds. So what you don't want is that guy operating that crane in the back, picking up this valve, dropping it on your car or your truck. It, it would cause a little scraping and uh, maybe a few dents, who knows. So before we go on to the swing flex, is there any questions on the plug valve that anybody wants to, uh, to ask? If you do, type it in and we'll, we'll come back to it, okay? So here we go. Uh, let's get into the swing flex. Now the scope. The scope of the, the, scope of the valve uh, is two inch to 48 inch, and we go up to 250 PSI. Flanged, so quarter pound PSI cracking pressure standard. We can do all sorts of other ones, so just letting you know, that's what the standard is. The standard that this is made to is AWWA C508. Okay. And here again, like I told you earlier, this valve has been around for a long time. Now, this is the flow pattern um, going through the valve. So this is a four inch valve. It's typically you can pass a, a three inch solid, which is okay. But the main thing is the flow area. It's 100% flow at 35% degree open. Okay. It's got three moving parts. We've got the bonnet, the disc, and the body, or not moving parts, but you got three parts of the valve. Only one moves. All right. So it's attached between the body and the uh, bonnet. That's where the, uh, the disc is actually attached. It's up there. Okay. Comes standard with plugs on the top in the bonnet and the bottom in the body. And I'll explain later why. So the uh, um, non-clogged design, meaning that when it's open, it's flowing. So there's not gonna be any place in there to get anything clogged up into it to impede the flow. Here again, 100% flow area. It's got one moving part, the disc. We'll talk about the mechanical uh, indicator in a second. The dome access port, you can get in the valve, and just replace the, uh, the disc. Drop tight seating, uh, which also we'll get a little bit more into uh, in the next slide or so. Reinforced disc and then non-slam closure. And then the backflow actuator we'll also talk about here real quick. So this is the uh, close up of the disc. So you have nylon reinforcement going through the disc. You have your memory flex action part here. Gives you a lot, a lot of cycles with no problems. You have another reinforcement, steel reinforcement on here that takes care of where the seating is. So these little beads go up to the seat inside the valve body, okay? And it shuts off very nicely. This right here is the um, pad that hits the stop on the top of the valve. So it doesn't get any you know, damage to it in that. So one part that moves inside this valve. Now, I, I threw this in there because I, I saw this and I had to throw it in there. So I would like for you guys to give me the caption, okay, on what this is. Okay, what, what do you think the caption would be for this particular picture? You know, I got my thoughts and you know, I'm looking at it, you, you got the guy all, you know, going down the highway pretty fast and you got that little girl screaming something there and then you got the one in the back looks like she's pretty frightened. Um, so I had a couple thoughts. Anybody want to share any thoughts about what, uh, what you think the caption might be on this?
No? How about, how about the girl in the front there yelling out, hey, buddy, move it. You're going too slow. Or get out of our way or something, you know, to that respect. So, all right. Nobody wanted to chime in. Okay. So, uh, all right. So we'll just go on now. All right, accessories. Now, remember I told you that the valve comes with plugs at the top and the bottom? Plug on the top is to put a mechanical indicator up there. And that goes along with the disc. It just slides up and down, so it tells you if it's open or closed. And the backflow actuator goes in the bottom, and you just screw that all the way up so that disc goes all the way open so you can backflow. So that's cleaning out the pipe or, you know, doing whatever to get a reverse flow on that valve temporarily. So that's what that's for. Then over here, of course, you got the mechanical dial indicator riding up and down, but the oil cushion down below. Now, this is to slow down the disc at the few last moments of closure. It could be, you know, five degrees, 10 degrees, 15 degrees, whatever that's necessary for that particular application is what you set this oil cushion for. It can be set at different, you know, pressures and, and uh, slower, you know, things to make it go real slow down the last 15, you know, for a few seconds or a minute or whatever the case may be. So it really depends on what the application is, how this is set up. But it's to go very close, very slow closure on this, okay? And so we can provide that to you. Oh, somebody finally uh, put one in here. Go, daddy, go. I like that one. That's pretty cool. All right. Um, so a mechanical indicator, you could also have a limit switch. Now, this can be put in the field. So if the customer later on wants to add a limit switch to turn a light on and off in the control um, room or whatever, um, it can be added in the field later on. So, and it goes right up against there and that little shaft just pushes the switch, toggle switch one way or the other to go open or close. So materials of construction for the swing flex. Normal is ductile iron, but from three inch to 12 inch, we can do an optional stainless steel body and cover on uh, like 30 inch to 48 inch on the bigger sizes, uh, ductile iron body and the ductile iron, uh, you know, is up to 250 PSI. The disc can be Buna in a standard, but it can be EPDM, Viton, or here again, if there's some other material that we can make a disc out of, we can do that. The seat is fusion bonded epoxy as standard that's inside, but as an option, we can do a nickel weld or we can do a removable metal seat in the valve. Coatings, generally the interior and exterior of the valve is fusion bonded epoxy, or as an option, we can rubber line the interior or we can glass line the interior just like the plug valve. So we can get into solids or we can get into, um, um, so anyway, we can uh, we can do that. Now, just to show you, uh, here's a cutaway. This is a rubber lined uh, swing flex. Same thing, the whole thing, interior is all rubber lined. The flange face is all rubber lined. And if we do the glass lining, just like the plug valve, it stops right along this area here. So that way you have to use a gasket for that. And same reason, if you bolt it down too hard, it's going to crack the glass and then it's not going to do anything for you. So particular applications for this, mining, wastewaters, industrial wastewaters, cooling towers, slurries, abrasive sludges, all the nasty stuff. It really does well here again with that rubber lining in there will do very well um, in those kind of applications with this valve. The surge buster. Now, the Surge Buster basically is the swing flex with a spring in it. Uh, <clears throat> now, it's the same scope as the swing flex, two to 48 inch flange, quarter pound PSI standard uh, cracking pressure. 
it's built to AWWAC 508, same thing. The only difference is, is we put the dis accelerator in there or the spring. <clears throat> the spring moves along together with the reinforced disc. So it quickly closes the valve or yeah, the disc so it closes the valve. <clears throat> the um, accelerator is stainless steel as standard. Here again, though, if for some reason stainless is not good for the application, we can change that spring over to, like, say, a, a, just a regular steel spring or Inconel 750 or whatever. We can make that spring out of any kind of material that we want um, to match your application. Slamming potential reverses the flow quickly, stabilizes that disc under the flow conditions. We can adjust it. And what's nice is this spring is fully enclosed in the valve. So you have no lever or weight on the outside of the valve flapping around that you have to put a, a cage around it so that it, uh, the OSHA standard, so it doesn't hurt anybody or whatever. Now the disc accelerator uh, is patented and there's only two moving parts. You got the disc and the spring or the accelerator. That's it. And that's what it looks like. It just rides right on that disc right there, just open and shut and pushes it down. And so we can uh, we can do all sorts of things. We can adjust it, we can add more springs or, or adjust the spring you know, tension depending on what the application is. Um, time required to close the valve. You either have to close it quickly or slowly. And this is all dependent upon the application. So it's very, very critical to know that when you're choosing a check valve. Unfortunately, check valves are the most misapplied valve that there is, okay? It, it, it inevitably is misapplied unless you really get into and know what you're doing on this, okay? So you have to know all that and please make sure you do that download or that uh, handout that we have. Um, poll, next poll question. So let me bring this last one up here. And we're going to do that and we're going to launch it. So are check valves required to be full port? I'm going to let you put in your uh, your answers on this one. Ah, very good. Looks like we got a, it looks like just about everybody has responded to that. So I'm gonna close this out, then I'm gonna share it to you, share it with you. So the answer is no, it doesn't always have to be full port. And it truly depends on the application. So um, that was good, 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 good. So yeah, it it just really depends. Uh, like I said, you know, check valves are the most misapplied valve that there is, and it's not forgiving because that water hammer really shakes things up and makes a lot of damage to pipelines. Um, I had uh, I don't know if it was an opportunity, but I was in a plant, and I was standing pretty close to a 40, 44 inch pipe, and um, they had done something then the check valve went into and it water hammered and it literally moved that pipe about six inches up in the air off of its uh, saddle and uh, least to say I, it, it scared the uh, stuffing out of me we'll be nice about that so let's hide this and we're going to go on so Applications are pretty much the same for the surge buster as the swing flex. We're talking about, you know, abrasive slurry, sludge, cooling towers, you know, mining, portable water, not portable water, portable water digesters, desalinization, a lot of different applications. So we can do a lot of things with this, people. A lot of things, a lot of things. So let's go into uh, industrial wastewater and all sorts of applications to kind of give you an idea. Now, when I put these little X's up there, it's, it's showing for plug valves and 
the swing flex. The reason why is we put these two valves together a lot because uh, you always need a shutoff valve and you need a check valve by pumps and other uh, apparatus. So we, we put these together a lot because we can do the full port, we can do this you know, swing flex, we can do both in rubber lining, both in glass lining, whatever the case may be. So wherever there's an exit, when I'm talking about these next few slides, is for either the plug valve, swing flex, or both, or the surge bruster. Now, in this particular one, it's a typical industrial wastewater plant, which looks pretty much like municipal. The blue colored lines are more of the clean uh, liquids, and the brown lines are more of your sludges and waste. So, you know, we're, we're going through the affluent waters, the grit chambers, the clarifiers, the primary sludge lines, secondary sludge lines. Uh, the holding tanks and the sludge treatment places and the disinfection. Now, I didn't put the plug valve and the check valve in the blue lines because they're needed there too. So they can also be put in those kind of lines. So I just didn't want to get the slide too messy with a lot of X's and O's and stuff on there. So we can also do in the uh, in the cleaner waters too. We could do the plug valves and the flex. So this is kind of a typical wastewater treatment plant. Uh, you've got all your uh, place to take care of the sludge and uh, removals and clarify it and, and so on. You've got your cooling towers here and so on. So it's a typical processing uh, what you do on the wastewater. Now, um, plug valves and swing flex, this I told you, uh, this is a picture of uh, our plug valve and our swing flex uh, valve together in a pumping uh, station. So they go together very nicely. Now, this is a coal fire plant. This is a schematic of a coal fire plant. Um, I know they're kind of a dying breed, but there are many out there and they'll be around for a few more years. So um, what happens just briefly is you have your boiler, you have your coal. Um, it heats up the water that's in the boiler tubes that turns to steam. The steam turns to turbine, turbine turns to generator, generator makes electricity. Transformer turns it into AC current, which goes out to your homes. You can turn on your lights and so on. So what happens to the steam is it has to go through a condenser. So it's taking the steam and turning it back into water. So it's condensing it back. So what happens is, is water is being pumped from rivers, ponds, lakes, or whatever, from a pumping station into the cooling tower. That cool water or cold water is going into the condenser. Then it's skimming off or taking the heat off that steam, turning it back into water. So the heated water then goes to the cooling tower to cool down, then it's pumped again and it just keeps circulating back and forth. So then the condensed water or the condensed steam is pumped back up into the boiler tubes to turn into steam to do the whole thing again. So it's all reused. Okay? Whatever needs to be replenished is replenished by the river or the lake or whatever going into the cooling tower. So then the ash that's been burned off, the bottom ash, goes through valves into a settling pond. Then what happens is they settle that all down and then they take the water and they filter it a little bit and they bring it back in to the plant to do its job going through all this. Now what happens with the fly ash, which happens to be as light as air or lighter than air, gets goes out through the precipitator or the stack. So you've got um, you know all this being cleaned up. You got your fly ash then, and the fly ash then also goes to a setting settling pond uh, to settle out, and they use that water also to come back into the plant. And then the scrubbers and stuff inside the stack all make that nice and clean. So as it comes out, uh, the uh, the top of the stack, you've got uh, pretty clean uh, smoke. In a coal fire plant, you have your three boilers over here being fed by the coal coming up the conveyor belts into the uh, to boiler rooms. You have your cooling towers over here, cooling all that water and stuff down to make that steam and all that's pumped. And you have your you know, ash settling ponds and stuff over here to be able to take all that off and then they dispose of that later. So mining waste uh, treatment plant. Okay, um, I got the X's all over the place. I put them in the uh, 
the blue lines, which is more of your clean waters, the brown lines is more of your sludge or your uh, wastewaters. Um, they go all over the place. Here again, in the clarifiers, the, the treatment plants, the secondary clay, the sludge removal. Um, you got your sludge disposal and your treatment of the sludge and the digesters and, and so on. So you've got plug valves and check valves all over this waste treatment plant, whether it be mining or, or otherwise. And what we consider uh, industrial is if it's inside the, the fence of an industrial company is considered industrial. So it can be a wastewater treatment plant, but inside of a power plant or a mining process plant or whatever. Now, what it looks like on a mining process, you got your boiler over here. You got two boilers making electricity and steam to run this plant. Uh, you have your wastewater system over here, removing all the sludge and so on, cleaning things up. So uh, that's pretty much what that looks like. And in produced water, um, some of you may not have heard of this, uh, but if you're in um, Western Canada or Western Texas or in Ohio or Pennsylvania, you probably heard of produced water because of the fracking and, and the oil sand and so on and so forth. So what happens is produced water is the start of the frack, um, you put water, chemicals, sand, all down into the shale, uh, you pressurize it and then it cracks the shale, which then removes the natural gas and or the crude oils. And then what comes back out of the ground is called produced water because it's bringing out the water, the chemicals, the, the oil, the gas, minerals, whatever is coming up out of the ground is all coming up as produced water. And what they do is they take it and they truck it or pipe it over to uh, a treatment plant. These are holding tanks. And that goes into a separator after it's filtered a little bit to separate some of the oil and the solids and water and chemicals and so on. Then they start cleaning up that water mix and that. And it goes through a bunch of uh, filters and reverse osmosis stations and so on. Settling tanks to remove some more solids. Another filters before it comes out as product water. Okay. Now that water, depending what has to happen. It's either going to go to a municipality to get cleaned up for drinking water and so on, or it's going to go back into the fracking. So it's cleaned up enough that it can go back and do fracks, which is what happens normally with this water, uh, because it uses a lot of water to do its job and they need to stop replenishing it because it's using good water sources from other things. So this is, it, it kind of looks like a standard wastewater treatment plant, but it is basically for fracked water. And they clean it all up. And this is a stationary one or a big one that's permanent. And this will take care of, oh geez, probably a good 10 or 12 um, actual drilling sites or so, or even more. Uh, and this is all trucked in or piped in. They clean it all up and then they pump it back out again. Now what happens, depending on where the drilling site is, it could be out in the middle of nowhere, um, they set up small little um, independent processing areas. So this particular one might be good for, oh, I don't know, maybe six uh, drilling sites or fracking sites, um, or drilling rigs rather for where they're doing their fracking and that. And then they take the produced water, they actually clean it up here and then put it back in the ground. So it can go either way. So questions on anything up to this particular moment? I don't see any in there, so I guess we're doing okay. So let me go over the family of valves for Valmatic. Check valves. Now we've been talking about the swing flex and we've been talking about the surge buster, but we also have dual check. Um, dual disc check valves. The inline check valves are the silent check valves, tilting disc check valve, and swing uh, a swing, okay, with the lever and weight, 
And then we have the also cushion and stuff available for that, but we also have that. So we do have a multitude of different check valves, for different applications. We also have air valves. This is one of the valves that helped start the company way back when. We have air valves, vacuum valves, combination air and vacuum valves, wastewater treatment uh, air valves. So we have all of that available. <clears throat> and this will be the topic of my next webinar in February. Uh, this will be one of the valves that I'll be going over. So we can also do this in some other materials too. So don't be afraid to ask about air valves in the meantime. Our quarter turn valves. Now we've been talking about the plug valve, but we also have um, a full port AWWA ball valve that we use a lot for um, uh, like being a check valve. So we can quickly put an actuator, turn that on and off and do things with that, slow it down if need be or speed it up because uh, it's full port and there's no problem with, you know, what's going on with the pump going through that, but it can turn it off and that. So we use a lot of it in those type of applications also. The butterfly valve, um, that's going to be in the next seminar too. So we're going to do butterfly valves and air valves in the next uh, webinar in February. And then the quadrosphere ball valve, which some of you already know, uh, that goes into, uh, it's an API 6D ball valve. So it goes into a lot of oil and gas applications. But the ball is special to, um, because it's a flushing action. So there's not any gonna be any kind of solids or debris uh, holding up inside the valve. So we've been able to do it in a lot of severe type of applications. So we also have that available. And that was the topic of my last webinar that I did. So um, I just want to go over real quick our website. Uh, for those of you that haven't been on there, um, it's got a lot of information. It's, of course, all the brochures. Any kind of technical information you're looking for, it's got application bulletins, videos. In fact, we now have a, a video of the uh, quadrosphere uh, ball valve. Uh, on there. Uh, CAD drawings, maintenance manuals, case studies, specifications for each valve, white papers. One thing that um, I'm going to point this out, and of course I'll talk about it in February, is the air valve sizing calculator. It is absolutely uh, the, one of the greatest things that uh, is out there. I've had a lot of companies like uh, Black and & Veatch, Burns and & Mack, and Kiwit, and those guys absolutely standardized on our air valve sizing program because it's so good. So you got to check that out, guys, if you have any questions on that. Um, also to the handout, you can go in there. We have handouts on all sorts of different check valve things in there. But the one that I put on there uh, for you guys to download is a mythology of predicting check valve slam. So you got to uh, download that, guys, and read that. It's going to be very beneficial for you. Um, questions and answers. Does anybody have any questions that you would like to ask at this moment? Uh, if, if you don't, um, when I send a follow-up tomorrow, it'll ask you if you have what your thoughts are on the webinar. Um, please, uh, you've got my email already. Um, send in any questions anything that you may have uh, in the way of questions or whatever to ask. Uh, critiques too, please. Tell us how we did so we can improve and make this more beneficial to, uh, you know, in the long run as we go on with these things. Um, soon it will also be on our website um, as a uh, recording. So that way you can, you know, use it to, uh, uh, for other purposes down the road. So. Please, if you got any other questions or whatever, feel free to critique, ask questions or whatever. We'll be glad to answer them for you. And if there's no questions, well then thank you so much for attending and uh, being with us today. Um, I appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to uh, communicating with you later on. And again, thank you so much for your time and patience. And we look forward to seeing you again or talking to you again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.